How would your life change after encountering heaven? Our guest, Randy Kay, shares his experience in his new book, Dying to Meet Jesus. Randy, welcome to Real Life. Thank you, good to be here. But Randy, I, I'm, I'm not uh, exaggerating when I say your story is unbelievable. It, it truly is. And, and if one were not to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, it, it would be beyond their comprehension. I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain of that. I wonder if you could just share with us this unbelievable encounter that you had with heaven. Yes. I'd like to say that I was unique. The Gallup poll <laughs> came out that showed that actually uh, about one in 25 people claim to have an NDE. And I was one of the skeptics, a near-death experience I thought was either chemically induced, imagined, <laughs> or something thereof. So uh, I was skeptical until I had my own. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point we were on top of the world uh, in my business uh, career. Uh, I was out in Washington, D.C. We were introducing an Alzheimer's uh, drug. Uh, we were on the front cover of Time Magazine and uh, on all of the major networks to introduce a drug that would be a possible cure for Alzheimer's. Well, there were a series of of events that uh, caused us to, to lose that drug and FDA recall and then other things were happening uh, to cause us some financial stress and I was sitting in a coffee shop with my wife uh, drowning our sorrows in lattes mm -hmm. and so I said well at least we have our health and about two weeks later I flew out uh, for an interview with a company, a healthcare company and came back and I felt a heaviness in my calf. Uh, it wouldn't go away. I thought it was a strain. I had been exercising, bicycling, but uh, it continued to swell about uh, t uh, almost uh, one and a half times its size. Mm. So I thought, well, we were planning a trip after a lot of stress to uh, go in the San Joaquin Mountains in uh, Colorado and such. So I thought I'd go to the orthopedic surgeon and, and just get a, an anti-inflammatory drug. And I was rushed to the ER. And at that point, uh, they found through the CAT scan and through the ultrasound and such that uh, the D-dimer, uh, which is a coagulant uh, indicator in the blood, was, uh, was high, uh, that I had six blood clots. Oh my goodness. And so they had started in the calf, which is why the swelling. Mm -hmm. They had traveled all the way up the leg to the pulmonary artery, which is the main airway to the lungs. And so that blocked uh, my ability to breathe. Uh, I had a, a respirator then at that point to help me breathe. And the only other option was to transport me to a center that uh, where there was a trained surgeon to open the chest, remove the clot, and uh, it was determined that by the time I got to the center in San Diego that it would be too long and I would be dead. So a heparin drip, 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 and that continued for a number of hours as I uh, struggled to breathe. At the same time, there was an IV that was placed in, in my arm and then that was, became infected. So on top of having the pulmonary embolism, I had an infection and I became septic with uh, MRSA, one of the most uh, wow. drug resistant yes, uh, types yes. of bacteria. Yes. So that caused a state of what is called hypercoagulability, which is I was clotting now throughout uh, my body and the doctor had tried to remove some blood from my arm, wasn't able to do so. And um, he said, well, this is strange. And so it was like a traffic jam throughout mm -hmm. my body with uh, the roads being arteries in this case. So it was at that point that uh, not only could I not breathe from uh, the blocked airway, but also I was in septic shock. And I started, um, I started going into convulsions. And at that point, I, uh, everything went dark. Uh, I was, um, I was, and immediately, my wife tells me I can't cry during this segment because mm. the event is so strikingly real. Sure, sure. That um, 
immediately I was in a place that was dark to light to lighter. There was a light that was coming down that was, I couldn't look at directly because of its brightness. I could see in the distance these spiritual beings. I didn't know what to make of it. And I kept rising above. I could see my body below uh, for a period of time, but then I was rising and and at that point where I settled, um, there was a soft, and this is the part that's hard, mm. there was a soft body that was next to me. And, um, and I was literally cheek to cheek with this person. And I felt comfort beyond anything I had ever experienced in my entire life. Thank you, God. And um, the first thought that came to mind, Tom, was, so this is love. So this is love. Mm. And it took a while for me to turn because I didn't want to leave that place of comfort. And I turned to look and, and Jesus, and I knew instantly it was Jesus without ha him having to say anything to me. His eyes tunneled through me in all the dark places. He saw me in the way I've never been seen. Uh, on earth by anybody because he saw everything about me and I was in his presence and I dropped and I was in awe of the Lord Jesus Christ mm, and I wanted to stay God. there thank and you, I God. just I we didn't have to talk initially because I he knew what I was thinking I knew that he knew and I was I was just immersed in his presence Mm. with a peace I had never felt before. That's right. In the hospital, I was concerned because I had young children and I thought, well, how am I going to, uh, how am I going to provide for them and all of these cares and concerns while I was struggling in the hospital. But I knew being with the Lord that all of those concerns, all of those worries were as nothing. That's right because I was in the presence of the Lord and he had mm, all of it in Lord. control. Thank you, and uh, um, so I, I, I didn't even initially want to look around because the only thing I wanted to be was in the presence of Jesus. That's right, that's right. And uh, A peace that passes beyond human understanding. Oh, you know, our definition of love generally is one of um, emotion or feeling uh, or actions that speak love. Right. This was the first time that I had been aware of the person of love. Mm, the author. The John, <laughs> first John uh, 4, 7 through 21, that God is love. Mm. Um, I didn't understand that. But I knew love as a person. Right. right. And that everything about him emanated love. And I, was, I felt like an audience of one. <laughs> I felt like I was the only one. I knew what the great cares feeling. of the world were on him, uh, were upon him. But I felt like his, his, his undivided attention was exclusively on me. Mm. And that was probably the, one of the most overwhelming senses with the Lord was that, um, you know, the, the human mind, I know this from my business and training people, has a, a, a form of scattered thinking. You know, at any time we're thinking about right. perhaps dozens of other things. Uh, and that was the first time that uh, I sensed that, the, that Jesus's attention was solely focused on me, mm. that there were no distractions, nothing. And, uh, and I, was, I was the only thing that, uh, that, that he was thinking about and knowing at that time. And it, it was absolutely incredible. Randy, as, as I looked at your book and, and, and just had a chance to, to go through some of the unbelievable story, I couldn't help but think of Zacchaeus. And, mm. and how he didn't know Jesus, knew of him, yes. but, but didn't really follow Jesus, but, and probably would have been the last in that crowd that he would have thought Jesus would have called out. Yes. But that was a very similar experience to, to how Jesus called you out. You didn't have a relationship with him before that. 
I was an agnostic, and not just that. I was the Saul before he became Paul. Mm, right. <laughs> I was one who uh, not only disliked uh, Christians, you know, their <laughs> hypocrites and, and those uh, typical uh, arguments. I, uh, I had a disdain mm, for right. Christians right. in general. Sure. So I had studied the truth at Northwestern University um, earlier in my life. I worked with a bunch of uh, Brainiacs technicians. Sure. There was a computer there. We plugged in to disprove all religions, mm. uh, including Christianity. <laughs> and so we plugged in all of the data points, and I'm not a techie, I, but, uh, but they were. Right. And so we were able to refute uh, all of the other religions besides Christianity uh, as a fusion of beliefs or a single uh, individual who espoused a certain way. Uh, but the, the God of the Bible was validated through a corroboration of ancient documents uh, that I chronicle that research uh, in, in, in technical terms. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> I won't get into but essentially, this is the bottom line, and that is that it was determined through this study that uh, the chances of the Bible being uh, correct and inerrant were statistically in the area of 1.26 million to one. Hmm. So we had refuted all other religions but that. But still, um, although my mind could accept the probability that God, the God of Abraham and, and the God of Jesus Christ were real, I still had to experience that. That's right. That's right. And, yes. and, and, and I, I, want, I want you to, to, to unfold that portion of your story in, in a moment. And we're going to have more with Randy and, and talking about his new book, Dying to Meet Jesus, this incredible encounter that he had with heaven. And specifically, have an opportunity for you to translate this into your own life. 